Last month, the £7 million Nicholas U. Mail 4 meter telescope at Kitt Peak took this picture of spiral galaxy M106, which is 20 million light years away. I know, amazing, isn't it? Now, surely only an idiot just work could possibly think they could get something as good as that with something like this. My 600 pound rig. It's actually 700 quid, so I've swapped out the mount. But you know, thereabouts. And yet, and yet, according to the physics, there might be a way. And the reason is the atmosphere. The wobbly atmosphere makes everything we see from Earth look blurry. Take the moon, for example. If you look at it through a big scope, you can see the atmospheric wobbles quite clearly. And as soon as a scope gets above six inches, the size of our red devil here, the atmosphere is the critical thing. The atmosphere is what holds all telescopes back. Even two kilometers up on the top of Kitt Peak, there is still enough atmosphere above this giant telescope to stop it getting anywhere close to its full potential. Because even though its mirror is basically the size of this roof, it's not overcoming the wobbly atmosphere. The mind-blowing thing is that if we could somehow magically get rid of the wobbly atmosphere, then our little six inch scope here could theoretically match the resolution of the giant scope that sits on top of Kitt Peak. And us amateurs have got a really clever way of overcoming the wobbly atmosphere that the big boys aren't employing. 15 years ago, nerds like Damien Peach, it's Damien Peach pioneered a way of getting past the wobbly atmosphere when imaging the planets. The results are... Yeah. And if we can do the same thing with galaxies, then the world's army of amateurs can become a truly powerful force. Especially if we club together. Because on its own, my scope will take ages to collect as many photons as what Kit Peak does. But lots of scopes sharing data could get enough in one night. So the technique is called lucky imaging. All our hopes rest on it, but potentially it can turn a cheap little rig like this one into an amazing million dollar telescope. <laughs> I know, it does sound absolutely mad, but this is what we're going for. To match the resolution of the big scope, we're going to need to transform our cheap scope into a super sharp astrograph. A bit of an antique telescope. We're going to need to somehow get more performance out of our budgety mount. I remember that. It I is do. fantastic. And we're going to have to go somewhere dark. What the hell is it? Where I may or may not get attacked by aliens. Oh, it's coming towards me. And see whether our little six incher doing the lucky imaging thing, come on, can match the shot of M106 taken by the giant seven million pound scope on top of Kit Peak. Really, this is pretty revolutionary. Of course, in order to do that, we are going to need to make this scope optically as perfect as it can be. And that all starts with getting the right mirror in the back of the scope. Now I've got three cheap mirrors to choose from. Hopefully one of them will be good enough. It could be the original Edmund Scientific mirror that came with this 50 year old eBay purchase. 50 pounds, got it. Now I'm really hoping this American mirror isn't the best one because in the last video, we chopped down the red tube so that we could bring to focus the faster F5 focal ratio mirror that lives in this shorter white tube because this mirror was hand ground in Russia by the legendary optics company Tal. Tal is supposed to make brilliant mirrors. Now if I was a betting man, I'd bet on this one. But it might be that high-tech robotically ground mirrors trump old-school hand-ground mirrors. So I've gotten this modern mirror, like the ones you find in most modern telescopes, one that's been mass-produced in China's optical manufacturing megacity, Changchun. So three mirrors, China, America and Russia, three superpowers in the telescope world. Let's find out which mirror is best. Yes. 
Hello. Yeah, hi. Yes, hello. Terry, nice to meet you. Hello, Roy. Yeah, hello. Terry Pierce is a master mirror maker, and he and his gang at the Camden Mirror Makers Association can tell how good a mirror is simply by passing a light in front of it. It is incredible that just a, sh- a light bulb and a straight edge will show you deviations by sort of a millionth of an inch. The Foucault test is so sensitive, it is ruined by even heat coming off a hand. Okay, let's see if the Russian mirror is going to live up to the hype. Interesting, there's a big, there's a nice little ridge around it. Take a look at this. That's not good, is it? Oh man, the Russian mirror has an imperfection. A tiny ridge, three quarters of the way out. As far as I can tell, it could be a fractionally overcorrected towards the edge and undercorrected towards the middle. There's no way this Russian mirror could take on the giant scope on Kit Peak. Let's have a look at another one, shall we? Hopefully, this robotically ground Chinese mirror will get much closer to perfection. So it's very close to the edge, but I think the edge is very slightly undercorrected. Looks like modern mirrors ground out by robots are about as good as old school mirrors ground out by hand. Neither of them are awful. They probably both look as if they're about one eighth wave accuracy. Taking on the giant scope with either of these mirrors would be a waste of time. All right, now we're clutching at straws because the only mirror I got left cost me, along with the mount and the rest of the scope, 52 pound. Spookily, it has some links with a giant mirror. They're both 50 years old and both were ground out in the Tucson Valley under the shadow of Kitt Peak. That's the best one. Is it? That's the smoothest one, yes. This looks extremely good. This one, as far as I can see by the very gentle shadow, is probably spot on. The mirror is so good, all the society members want to check it out. That's beautiful. What you thinking? That's fantastic. Really? That's really beautiful, yeah. It's like a Henry Moore sculpture. Whereas the other two are a Henry Moore sculpture which he let one of his assistants do and they didn't quite finish it properly, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, really fantastic. <laughs> it is amazing. Incredibly, this old, cheap American mirror is good enough to give the four-metre mirror a run for its money. I just wish I hadn't butchered the scope this mirror lives in. But, um, so you know... That's the edge, folks. That's really nice. Do you know what I've done? Yes, it does. I um, cut the uh, tube down to F5, because I assumed I'd be using an F5 mirror. Oh crap, oh dear. Oh, sacrilege. Actually, it was an antique telescope, wasn't it? Well, it was on eBay and no one bought it. So it's still an antique telescope? Oh dear, yeah. But there we are, what can we say? Looks like I've really stuffed up. You're too impatient, you didn't give yourself... Astronomy is a very slow subject, you didn't give yourself time. Yeah. Right? Oops. So it wasn't a new tube? No, it was an old tube. It was the one that you purchased. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Terry clearly was not happy with me uh, chopping up the antique mirror. Oh dear. And uh, by the reaction on everyone's faces when they saw that mirror, and how good it was, then uh, I feel pretty bad too. See you, Terry. Turns out I might have a shot of redemption. You know where you can repair it and put it back together? You really have just totally destroyed it. I've cut it too short. Can't let me bond it back on again. You can get sort of all those super glues and things, bond it back together, if necessary, put a band around the outside just to keep it keep it trim. Yeah, I think I'll do that. It's much easier, really. If I can get hold of the bit Uncle Sam chopped off... What do you want to do with this little bit? No, that's... I don't need that. Then I should be able to repair the American scope. Hey, man. How you doing? If I'd known you were coming, I'd have done my hair. I'm, yeah, really good. Harry, the wood thing is? Good. I can't wow. find your uh, bits of tube though. You haven't got the tube? I, I think somebody's cleaned them out. It's gone, dude. Shit. At this point, in all honesty, the mission is on the rocks. Hiya. But I ain't giving up. I spent two months hunting down a replacement tube that was within budget. 
and a month refining the tube with a fancy thin spider vane system. But all this was in vain, because then this happened. Sam! You alright? Yeah, good. Found something. Oh yeah? What? You're joking. One minute wasn't there, next minute was. You mean the next four months later it was? Oh man. Did you need it? <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I am a little bit lost for words, but I think we should now inform Kit Peak that it's game on. On the Astro Biscuit Discord server, there is a 3D printer factory channel. And for the price of a few biscuits, I was able to order up this. Hey Rory, here it is, all finished, all done. So with any luck, you can get your telescope put back together. Best of luck. Mark, mate, thank you. I love this 3D printing thing. Uh, and look, it fits. Now that our super sharp mirror has a home, we don't want anything dampening its performance. There's a blooming great obstruction that sits right in front of the primary mirror. It's the secondary mirror. The secondary mirror's obstruction loses us resolution. The light hits the obstruction and kind of makes ripples. And the larger your obstruction, the more ripples and the more blurriness is created. Normally, you can't just check in a smaller secondary mirror because it won't be big enough to collect all the light from the primary mirror and some will spill out the front. But now we've got a longer tube. By the way, thanks for the awesome graphics, Sam. It takes ages for the light from the primary mirror to reach our secondary mirror, which means the light cone gets really tiny, which means we only need a tiny 35 millimeter wide secondary. Annoyingly though, the longer tube means the camera has to get closer to the tube to reach focus. And this tall focuser won't allow that to happen. So, we're gonna have to use this, which isn't great. Right, so I'm using this really crappy focuser because it is short. Short enough to reach focus. And finally, to avoid unwanted internal reflections, like what we got on the horse head last time out, I'm painting everything that ain't a mirror black. She's only gone and come back, isn't she? What a beauty. And even though she's cheap, her fantastic mirror and tiny secondary should make her razor sharp. Oh, I missed you. You better watch out, Kit Peak, because we're coming. Only we're not coming just yet, because there's a few other sources of blurriness we need to fix first. Like the mount, whose job is to spin in exactly the opposite direction to what the Earth does. Now Kit Peak's mount is blooming awesome and suffers from almost no mount wobble. Having no mount wobble is what us amateurs dream of, because if you imagine that this is a star and inside of the photons, and the photons of the star are flying out, and they're heading towards Earth, and they're heading towards the sensor. This is the sensor on the back of our telescope, you know, like the camera. Well, if you've got no mount wobble, then this happens. All the photons from the star end up going in one pixel. My last mount, however, wobbled by 1.4 arc seconds. It's gone mad. So, the light coming in from a star would have hit the sensor like this. I know it looks hokey, but actually the amount of wobble relative to the size of the pixels is correct. And this shows you clearly why mount wobble leads to blurry images. My new mount though, even though it's 25 years old, is awesome. It's got professionally tuned and it only wobbles by 0.8 arc seconds. This is what happens with the new mount. It's much, much better, but it's still not perfect. And unfortunately, this mission that we're doing is so tough that actually 0.8 arc seconds isn't good enough. We really need to get our wobble down to below 0.5 arc seconds to stand the chance of matching the Kit Peak scope. South of London, in an undisclosed village, in a shed at the bottom of an undisclosed garden, lives the wobble killer. David? Dave from Dark Frame. Hello. The Yoda of amateur mounts. But I brought you this. It's not actually some sandwiches. Oh Ooh. wow, I remember that. Yes. 
It is absolutely fantastic. I only know about Dave Woods because the previous owner of my wonderful mount had gotten Dave to tune it some years ago. I'm such a lucky boy, aren't I? Yeah, you To are. have gotten hold of this. Especially for the price you did. You did yeah. well. So can Dave make a good mount even better? This is what we call a buttermilk one, so it's quite yeah. old. This one dates yeah. around about 2006, so it's 14 yeah. years old. Yeah. So the fact that it can run sub arc seconds, great. Obviously a new version, if we had a virgin mount to work with, you'd be looking at around about 0.4. My old mount might not manage 0.4, but Dave might be able to get it close. This is a good one, especially if you've got a Skywatcher. Run the right voltage. Now I thought the right voltage was 12 volts, being as it says, 12 volts. If you add a, just an extra volt or two, that actually lowers all the spikiness that you get in your tracking errors. That is an absolute golden nugget. Is, is that just because the motors have a little bit more oomph? Yeah, and so absolutely. when it yeah. comes across it a bit of resistance, it, it just... It actually increases the torque and it makes such a difference. Thanks, mate. That's awesome. And thanks for tweaking my worm gear spacing. Fingers crossed it's going to work. The last thing we've got to do is the one thing that Kit Peak can't, and that's overcome the wobbly atmosphere using the technique known as lucky imaging. Lucky imaging is so obvious that you'll be surprised that people haven't been doing it before. Instead of taking a handful of say five minute long shots like what I did when I shoot in the Whirlpool Galaxy, you take hundreds if not thousands of much shorter say five second shots. Then you throw away all the shots that the atmosphere has made too blurry, leaving just the nice crisp shots that just happened to have been shot during a moment of lucky atmospheric calm. Old school CCD cameras aren't really very good at it, but new CMOS sensor cameras are. These cameras have a really low read noise, which means you can take loads of really short exposures and stack them on top of each other and get good results. The exact model of camera I'm using was inspired by my nemesis, this is the anti-biscuit, a robotic telescope called Stellina is actually pretty blooming good. However, the camera does benefit from being cooled down, which can be done for under 10 pounds if you use a Peltier cooler, a computer fan, and fix it all together with a 3D plastic thingy. Oh, and a sock. Ta -da. All right, folks, this is where it gets exciting. This is my first ever my first ever Astro car night. I've had a tip off about a dark, geeky location surprisingly close to London. Church is there. Oh, here we are. Oh. This is going to be our home for the next 12 hours. London is 20 miles that way. The thing we're going to shoot, Galaxy M106, will be appearing ah, right where those trees are. Hmm. cost me 700 quid that by the way and I know I've been very lucky with the mount and very lucky with the with this with the mirror as well but for 700 quid if she does what I hope she's going to be able to do with this lucky imaging technique then you know really really this is pretty revolutionary of course that's only going to hold water if we manage to pull this off and there is no guarantee that we will Win or lose, I will, however, show you the result. Unfortunately, setting up a telescope attracts clouds. It's a bit like red rag to a bull. And I'm getting the screaming heebie-jeebies because I spotted someone walking past the church. There is one bit of good news though, we're not shooting that way. 
So the glow from London is mad. Happily, though, we're looking up there and it gets, I mean, the gradient of light is so extreme. It's like I need my sunglasses almost at night to look that way, but this way is dark. And that's where the galaxy is. And it's actually beginning to get clear. I better get going. Shai, 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 it's cool. I gotta say, this focus is a pain. Is the galaxy in the center? Come on. Ooh, look, look, there it is. All right, let's get PhD2 guiding. So Dave, you're gonna be happy, huh? 0.6 RMS error. She's ready for battle. Let's see if the red devil can turn the world of astrophotography on its head. The target is 23 million light years that way. Now we are going to begin this adventure. Come on, Red Devil. Come on. I'm kicking off by taking a thousand five second long shots. I can see little bits of cloud inside the center core. I mean, I, sh it's, I think we're getting stunning resolution already. Look how calm it is out there tonight. Really, it's just perfect. Absolutely perfect. At 2.15, this happens. Okay, two very weird lights over there. Two very weird lights. Can you see them? The lights are hovering very low on the far side of the field. Okay, this is a bit spooky. What the hell is it? There are these two lights that are just like flying around. You can make it up. I really don't want to turn my light on now. Well, there's one there now. Oh, the other's gone up there. <laughs> I mean, this makes perfect YouTube material, isn't it? But I... Oh, it's coming towards me. So I did what any reasonable man would do and tried to hide underneath the dashboard. I waited a bit and when I popped my head up, it had vanished. Whew. <laughs> that, did, that did get me. That got me. It's gonna take many, many, many nights for the Red Devil to catch as many photons as Kit Pete's giant mirror. Not that it'll make a big difference imaging the core, which has loads of photons coming from it anyway, but the faint outer edges of the galaxy, that's when you need more photons. So I'm gonna let her run till dawn and I'm gonna come back to this field as often as I can. So, night night everyone, night night thing that's rustling in the bushes. Night night UFOs, I'm going to bed. <laughs> and night night red devil, what amazing job you are doing. Honestly, I think this is really gonna be something special. Oh. Five a.m. Could it be our friends have returned? Ah, that's Jupiter. <laughs> it's not a UFO. Phew. Still, probably worth getting out of Dodge quickly before Farmer Barley Mo mows over our Barlows. The next night wasn't looking quite so good. Now it's not looking great right now. If you look out the window, I don't know if you can see the windscreen. Anyway, it's raining. I had to wait until two in the morning before the skies cleared. Oh, nothing like sitting in a field on your own by a graveyard with a pretty cold cup of tea. Mm. The night after that, the skies were clear, but I was so tired I didn't notice that the Red Devil was a bit out of collimation and I had to throw everything that I shot that night away. I've got like six hours worth of data here. 
which isn't great. And it's way less than what Kit Pete got. Even so, it's actually turned out pretty well. Here it is. If you compare it with Kit Peak's shot, you can see that Kit Peak's galaxy is way brighter, but we knew that. And the thing is, there's only one Kit Peak, but there's hundreds, there's probably thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of amateurs. And many of us have got reflectors like this Red Devil. And if we club together, we'd be able to match Kit Peak's photon count, and we'd be able to get the outer edges of the galaxy beautiful and sharp, just like what Kit Peak has. The real question is, can we match Kit Peak's resolution? And that's what this test is about. And that's what we're about to find out. Traditionally, even big amateur scopes like this one have fallen short. Let me show you this. Trevor Jones from Astro Backyard shot this beautiful shot from his light polluted backyard. He's done very well here. You can even see the little hydrogen jets spouting out, which is amazing just shows what you can do from an urban location. Even so, Trevor's big scope was unable to compete with Kit Peak in terms of resolution. And that is kind of like the standard resolution that you're gonna be able to get doing everything perfectly uh, in the old way of doing things. Let's find out how much more detail Lucky Imaging buys us. The only place we're gonna be able to see whether my low photon count shot the only place we're going to see if it matches Kit Peak is in the core. On the left, we've got the standard way of doing it. In the middle, our lucky imaging technique. And on the right, Kit Peak. We're going to focus on the dark dust clouds that are circling the galaxy's core. About here is where Astro Backyard shot the resolution starts to fall apart. And as far as I'm concerned, we're still good to carry on. Let's go in a bit further, shall we? And please do me a favor and try and ignore the absolutely astonishing red hydrogen alpha jets in the Kit Peak shot, because those are photon count dependent. Let's just concentrate on the dark clouds. I have to say, it's looking astonishingly good. That. That is incredible as far as I'm concerned. I honestly can't tell you which one is sharper. It's so exciting. Fellow nerds, we could be at the dawn of a new golden age of amateur astronomy, where we capture things that even the professionals struggle to get. We can match the resolution of multi-million dollar scopes. The next step is to see if we join forces whether we can match the giant scope's photon count too. Yeah, it's game on. If we club together, then we have got ourselves a humongously powerful amateur telescope. A big amateur telescope. Big project though, big project. As we speak, the very beautiful and talented Geeks and Ryan from the Astro Biscuit Discord server are setting up a platform where we can coordinate and share data. And you can join us right now by clicking on the link to the big amateur telescope below. So please, 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 please share this video to anyone who you think might be interested so that we can get this big amateur telescope working. And if you want to find out what kind of level you need to be at and what kind of kit you need to join in, then please check out my website. And don't be fooled, the sharpest telescopes aren't necessarily the most expensive. So links below for an 8-inch f4 or even a 10-inch f4 would be amazing. And if you do want an incredible mirror, then why not look at Orion Optics UK? These guys make mirrors as good as my old Edmund Optics. And if you mention Astro Biscuit in the special request section, then I will get commission. And I need every penny I can get at the moment, which is why I want to say a massive thank you to my patrons, especially Felix and Fabio. Thanks guys, thanks all patrons. Big thanks to the super clever nerds on the Astro Biscuit Discord server. It's a lovely, lovely community. Please come and join us. One chap has even managed to build a community astrograph which can be piloted from the server. Huge thanks to Richtenstein for doing the incredible music. 
his album is in the link below. And here are a selection of Astro Biscuit's best videos. And maybe a big company could sponsor the big amateur telescope. This was a good one, wasn't it? Despite the fact that I got properly schooled by the mirror guys. All right, laters.